Casey Thompson is officially out for Michigan, and we are officially in to the uh, Pick 6 podcast. Hello, everybody. I'm Sam McEwen, along with the heavy hitters here again, Tom Chattel and Dirk Chatlin uh, on a Thursday. It's a uh, it's gonna get chilly Thursday. We're finally moving into the winter weather. I'm happy about that personally. What uh, I I am as a as a modest uh, as a moderately fat man. Uh, I have natural padding that allows me to stay warm in in this See. environment without too much clothing. Sam, you uh, you on the other hand, the older I get, the colder I get. <laughs> really? Oh okay. yeah, that's fine. Circulation <laughs> breaks down when you reach forty. So the living room <laughs> has multiple blankets. Is that what you're oh, telling me? Oh, several. We've got like nine in our living room. Yes. Like they just and it's like they appear on our on our front porch. <laughs> Where did this one come from? Well, I got it from this person who didn't need it anymore. And so there's like nine blankets. Nebraska may need nine blankets to beat Michigan this weekend. They are a 30 and a half point underdog uh, on uh, on the road. It may be the largest spread of all time. We think it kind of is, but there may have been a game somewhere in the 50s when they were playing Oklahoma and you know uh, Joe the bookie and Lincoln might have had a 42 point spread on it. You just it was never like Bugsy know. Bugsy Siegel back then. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Do you remember what the line was when Michigan came to Memorial Stadium last year? Um, I'm going to say it was uh, seven, two and a half, two and a half. Two and a half. So Gosh, Nebraska went from, in 13 months, they went from a two-and-a-half-point underdog to a 30-point underdog mm. against a fairly similar Michigan team. Very similar. In fact, if you would like, I thought Michigan this year was going to go 11-1, and one, um, but I thought they were going to lose, they're going to lose to Ohio State. But I also said they're going to have the best offense in the Big Ten, which they don't. They have the second-best offense behind Ohio State. But I said their defense was going to take a hit because they lost Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo and Dax Hill. No, no, no. They're better. They're better than they were last year. And so um, kudos to Jim Harbaugh. We're going to talk about Nebraska football going up there, what can be accomplished, uh, the odd dynamic now, which is soon to end, between Mark Whipple and Mickey Joseph. And just just even though it comes in a different sort of packaging, how close is Mark Whipple really to Bob Diaco? Because at this point it seems kind of like they're both on their own little sort of uh, revolutionary tracks. Um, I do want to talk about Nebraska basketball a little bit. How they went, how they did uh, their their opening game, and then maybe a little volleyball if we get to it at the end, um, because they have a huge match this weekend, and we care about volleyball here. But uh, I guess I'll start with this. How are you guys doing? Uh, we we're rounding into November. Thanksgiving is a few weeks away. Who's Nebraska's football coach going to be? I don't know, but <laughs> I'm intrigued by uh, the the name. Uh, J- 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 uh, the, 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 the Army coach, uh, Monk. Uh, Jeff Monken. I'm really intrigued by him because, as I've said before, this is the the coach who arrives for the press conference in two or three weeks should show up in a, 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 a giant cement truck because the first two or three years is going to be basically the foundation. Mm-hmm. And... Win seven if you can. Win eight. Wow, wouldn't that be fun? Right. But get used to going back into bowl games. Mm-hmm. Get used to winning and beating some teams, and the, and then let's worry about glamour and glitz and all that stuff. Um, I, so I'm I'm intrigued by him because he's he he's he's he's, he's won at a lot of he, he's he, won at Army. Yeah. And and uh, that's not easy. But my question would be, can, can he recruit? I mean, I, I don't know how the how recruiting works at Army. Do they do they, they come to you? Do you go do you go get them? Or, I mean, how everybody does that work? who goes to Army is paid for. Yeah, right. So they all have scholarships. They get scholarships through, obviously, but, a, a different a different way. But they have huge rosters, right? So they have a special dispensation at right. the service academies. Um, they have special dispensations for how they practice. They can practice longer. Uh, there's special things that allow that you're allowed at the service academies that aren't at other schools. That would be an adjustment for him. Like he and, and but he coached at Joe's, Georgia Southern before right. he went to Army. He was there with uh, I think Paul Johnson. I think at one time. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about a paradigm shift though? So it's just ten days ago that Mickey Joseph in a Sports Illustrated article, right. which I felt like was designed to present Mickey Joseph as the Nebraska football coach candidate. I think it was a sort of a <laughs> SI comes in, right? You know, there's you know, Coach O's former chief of staff sets up the guy that used to cover LSU, and they go from SI, and he's up here, and he's sitting in with the staff. Access that we're never granted. 
big long interview with Mickey. They go play Illinois. I think Nebraska thought they were going to beat Illinois. They don't beat Illinois. The story shows up on Monday. It's Mickey as the head coaching candidate, and he says, "We're not chasing. We're chasing Ohio State. We're not chasing Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa." That's his program statement. We're going to recruit that. We're going to recruit our ass off. You want to talk about a gap? The gap between Mickey Joseph and Service Academy guy that's going to come in and run the triple option and recruit two and three stars from the Midwest, that's that's a gap. The AD, the, Trevor Alberts is closer to the, the, the Service Academy guy by far. Yeah, he I, wants, I'm not disagreeing. The guy he you. introduces, I believe, is, is, is people are going to say, well, this is underwhelming. The, the, who is this guy? I, I'm, not, I'm not impressed. Um, he's boring. He doesn't recruit. Um, now, if 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 it, if it's Kleiman or Leipold, they know that name. They'll be a little bit excited, but um, again, I just think if you listen to Trev last year, so I I know what he wants, and it's not it, it's not gonna be Mickey. I don't I just don't I don't believe that. But but anyway, well, what a great PR move by I would guess the the Mickey Joseph camp to have the SI. I mean, right, if they'd won it, the game. Yeah, it would, it well, it I mean, it, it was a gamble, but yeah, it, it, it was a, it, it was a, I think, a, and, and obviously he, he, he knew the writer. He had a relationship with him. He did has one. So, I mean, it, it, it was pretty savvy. But uh, you, like you said, you got to win. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> who's the head coach in two and a half? Months? <laughs> you don't know for sure. I'm, I know uh, that. I'm I not asking the, for the guarantee. I dodged the question. I I think he already knows, and I I, I But I, you're I, interested in Munkin, okay? I, am. I think the uh, I think the most likely candidate is Lance Leipold. Um, okay. I think there's some some long shots on the board that you know. I think uh, I think the Chris Peterson thing would be really interesting. I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Dave Aranda thing would be really interesting. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I I agree with you that and Dave's making a mistake. If he if he if they offered it before they offered it to Leipold and Aranda <laughs> says no, in my opinion, he made a mistake. I agree with you that I think uh, with you guys that I think it's probably already done. Mm-hmm. Um, which is one reason why it's so quiet. If it wasn't already done, you'd hear a lot more talk. Mm. Uh, in my opinion, so. Uh, but I think the most likely candidate is is you know three hours down the road. Why would he say no to Nebraska? Leipold? Mm-hmm. I don't think he would say no to Nebraska. But why would he if he did? Because um, and I, I I don't know him well, but I know him, and he's the kind of guy that he he's, he does things. His he's got a a certain I guess ethical set and. It would be hard for him to leave after, after you know, this is my second year there. I can't do it yet, and uh, so I think that would be if he does. If he does turn it down, if he's offered and turned, that would be the reason I think. Okay. And it's not because KU's building a building and they've got money. No, it's nothing about it's uh, that. Always be basketball first, and it's, we've gone through the the, the, the the difference between the the, 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 the two conferences um, if he was <clears throat> if he was hesitating somebody in his inner circle needs to say Lance you're pushing 60 years old the University of Nebraska just called right you take the job right um, that's, that's a very good point I don't think he would say no hmm um, okay. now, a few years ago Jeff Brom I, 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 I did tell Louisville his that's his hometown, no. Um, and I think he said, I can't leave yet. And, and then he got a, a, a giant deal. And now he's he's he's, he's kind of cooled off a little bit. I'm not well, sure. Well, Louisville's coach is going to stay. Yeah. They're a good team. Although I think Louisville. They caught will, fire. I think that, I, I think we'll still go after him. But, um, well, no, Louisville is going to play Clemson this week, I think. Yeah. And I think Louisville is going to win. They're not firing that coach. No. He's, they're 6 Bob three. Was, Yeah, and, and, and they're getting good. They're Bob good. Said, if they were, if the job weren't open, I think they, they, they wouldn't they sure, would go after Brom that. was 10 years younger when he decided to stay at Purdue. Exactly. And yeah. I think that's a factor, too. I, I agree. Um, and Lance has got – he's got connections here. I mean, he's not, not – I'm not saying he's well-connected, but he has familiarity, but, memories right. – um, I think he's comfortable here. He recruits it like it. It makes a lot of sense. I, I agree that it makes a lot of sense. But what's interesting is when the whole you know thing went up last week on Thursday, that wasn't the name that came up. No, and 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 I don't. It, Mickey was one. 
Matt Rule was another. I don't think Matt Rule is necessarily a contender here. I think that name came up for a very specific reason related to some other job. Yeah. Um, but the point that I guess the point I'm at is there, there's been some sense among some people that Mickey Joseph is like a legit candidate for the job. And if he's a legit candidate for the job and they offer the job to Lance Leipold, there would be no reason for Mickey Joseph to be a legit candidate for the job. If I know that sounds like I, I just said something out of the David Mamet play, but seriously, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like it, we keep hearing Mickey Joseph's name as if this thing is still not quite finished. But if Lance Leipold was asked, and we know that he would say yes, and I don't know why this what? keeps like why not? You know how how do you get that out and leak it out that he's like a leading candidate, or maybe Trev doesn't want to burn him because he's still coaching KU. I don't know. I just. We're, we're two and a half. Either. We're two and a half, three weeks away from from having to make this decision. It has to be done, and yeah. it feels. And it, I think people are getting kind of antsy, and that's why you hear these leaks and these other things. And I'm still baffled that nobody has come out and said I'm staying. Nobody, any of these candidates, whoever they are, has gotten a, a giant raise or someone said, oh, I, I, I pulled just got a new extension, five more years at whatever." Right, it hasn't happened. I, I mean, if it did. They would announce it. They would tell the world that this guy's off the market. That's a heck of a good point. That has not happened. And I, 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 I thought Trev was going to get a lot of guys' raises, and I haven't heard about that. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I think it's, it's that, very interesting. Don't and, you think Iowa State's done everything it's going to do for Matt Campbell, and now he needs to win and not just I know um, being like the guy that constantly comes up but, in the job but, searches? But, that, but like, 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 last Saturday, Bruce Feldman went on Fox. He did. He said, here are here – are, my four Nebraska names. There's just no buzz about this job nationally. Nobody's talking and his about four it. Na- his, did his four names include Lance Leipold? No. It didn't. It was Matt Rule. Yeah. Gary Patterson. Yes. Mickey. No. Well, who were the Bonka. other two? Uh, the Army coach and um, uh, o- O'Brien. Which, okay, you know. There's but, things about Bill O'Brien that are so close to Bo Pelini that you have to be really, really comfortable with with what he will bring to the table. Because Bill O'Brien is not Bo in the sense that he loses his, you know, uh, jelly beans on the sidelines <laughs> the way that Bo did. Right. <clears throat> but Bill O'Brien is, he's brusque. Like, he's, he's further to the brusque side than Mark Whipple. And Mark Whipple's brusque. He would probably need... He, 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 Mark Whipple like rides away in a cart when he doesn't see a throw he likes. Like he's brusque, and Bill uh, O'Brien's even further down the line of um, brusque. This is what <laughs> Scott Frost didn't know about Whipple and brought him in because it, he needed the big name to kind of help save him. It a is a bit. big name, and but he comes with, and I love Whipple. We get along great. I talk to him all the time, but he's, he's right now he's in. I don't care mode. I don't. I'm going to do what I you know. Uh, Head coach wants to run the ball. Well, the, 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 he said yesterday, "I don't doesn't matter." I think he thinks they can. Doesn't do matter it. how you do it. it you know, you, you just got to score points. I think he thinks that the offensive line can't get it done. Well, well, right. He would be better, and I, I mean it. He would be better off saying, "Well, if they could run the ball, we won." Like he'd be better off doing that than the thing he's doing, where he's like. It's about the scoreboard, and each game is unique. And I'm like, I get it. But you're like, I get it, I understand it. I think he was mad at Mickey for saying Logan wasn't practicing well. And so yesterday, I don't know if you saw the video, but somebody, I think it was Brian Christofferson, asks him, well, you know, Mickey said he wasn't practicing well. And and, and Whipple's like, uh, um, well, Mickey needs to go over to the defense. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't say a guy's not practicing well like that, yeah. apparently. And then he's like, and then he goes on to say, "Well, Logan's practicing just fine. Is Logan banged up? Is he a little, so the, you know? There's the, a lot of things the, out there. This little drama play between the two, it's not helping anybody, and it's not, it's, it's certainly not helping Mickey at no. all. No, it's certainly not helping him at all. So, um, it's but of those four, co- so Feldman and Feldman's connected. We're not, we're not trying to say that he is, and he's connected to agents. I'm just saying, or I, I, but those four names, those don't seem like the four names that I would have. There's no buzz about this job nationally. Munkin is is involved in a lot of these jobs, and I think he's got an active agent. Gary Patterson, if you're going to bring him in, then you need to have like a. Well, he's got. He, he, I don't even know what the right word is. Like a like a, an intermediary. Because well, he's he's a little like O'Brien, but the but the 
the players really do like him, but I just think he he ran out of gas at TCU. Sure, I don't, is he going to come back and, and is he is he going to be ready to go? Well, Brian, I don't. Why would he want Nebraska's job? He could go to Georgia Tech tomorrow. Who? And coach there? Who's that? Bill Bryan. No. What? I mean, did you really? You want to come to Nebraska? When you you know when you spent most of your career on the East it's, Coast, Georgia Tech's out there. That's it's funny problem. to read the Alabama fans' comments about him. They hate, they hate him. Well, they, he throws the ball a lot, and they don't have receivers uh, like, yeah. like they used to. So. Um, Anything, but he also he thinks a lot of himself. Like he is, and it's not, it's okay. I, I but he's know, just, I, I, I think he's a lot like a. And then the, and then the, the other name obviously is you know the name that. My understanding, is that Matt Rule is just not, going to coach. So like I don't know why that name keeps coming up. New Heisel went on the radio today and said he he doesn't think Matt Rule is going to coach for a while. No, yeah. Um, well, I think I think that's and he general, hears, I think he Rick would know. Stuff. He hears stuff. Um, I has anybody said the name Luke Fickle in a while? No. Is that a possibility? <clears throat> Is it gonna be somebody who comes out of the comes out of the out of the whatever? It's it's too bad that it's too bad that Kleiman is probably not available. He, uh, he is. Because he's put together a heck of a resume. Yes. You know, and yeah. you know, stylistically and temperamentally I think he would fit really well at Nebraska. Um Right up into the media, I think. Well, but... I think the media would give him a hard time. Perhaps. <clears throat> but the media here is not... We're not brutal. Not brutal. Uh, no, I, it's, I agree with that. They're, but, they're attentive and they're, you know, engaged, surely. We're just relentless. <laughs> Maybe I'll be honest. I, well, and, and I've... I've, I've, I've <coughs> Maybe I defend Scott Frost a little too much. But I've come around to this. The ex-player thing is a factor now. And it's more of a factor for an ex-Husker. But it's a factor. Like, it's a factor. And those guys want Mickey. Chris Kleiman does not want to deal with that. Because I I don't... (coughs) At Kansas State, is there really anything going on? (coughs) With ex-players? No. Do you (laughs) want to know why? How do you know that? Well, you want to know how I know? I'll tell you how I know. How big is Manhattan? They're not sticking around. They don't, I mean, they don't live there. Omaha and Lincoln, they're close together. Omaha and Lincoln, you know, are close. The media markets are close. Like, <coughs> Manhattan is not is not Kansas. It's not Lawrence. It's not Kansas City. I just don't think they have that big of an issue there. I really don't. My point being that, like, the, the ex-player thing here is real. You, you can't just ignore them. You can't just be like, hey, uh, I'll talk to you in six months. Uh-uh. No. Oh. They're all on the radio. It's fine, too. Like, that's great. They're part of the media. That's great. They're they're on the media a lot. You know, there's there's a radio station now in Lincoln that's got almost exclusively, you know, former ex-Huskers. I kind of like listening to it at times because it's kind of like listening to my childhood. Like, you listen to stuff from the 90s, and <laughs> they talk about games that you remember seeing, and it's kind of fun. But like those guys are around and like they want access and and that's that's a I don't think Kleiman would be down for that. I think Kleiman wants to run a program that's just like a football team that's like separate of everything else. And he's got an AD that does that exactly. It just covers him in Gene Taylor. I don't think he wants to. I can see Chris Kleiman going to Iowa one day. I think he would take the Iowa job over Nebraska. Smaller bubble. You don't agree? No, I think that's fine. Um, I just, you know. Little bubble. I'm so tired of hearing about, oh, Nebraska is such a hard place to coach. Oh, I don't know how anybody could survive at Nebraska. The scrutiny, the attention. Mm -hmm. Alabama players are walking by ESPN trucks every day when they walk into practice. Right. Like, get over it, people. They're five stars. They're great players. They're, they're the great s- players. They're the same maturity level. Sure, like, this is true. If if those guys, if if Tennessee can turn it around as quick as they have and play with the poise that they did at, you know, in the games that they have to Noted. this point, like, <clears throat> yep, that's fair. Stop with the excuses. I'm not disagreeing with you there. It doesn't affect the I players, swear. but it's the coaches, and that's why you need somebody to come in who's done it, who, who's who's been through this before. And just to tell everybody, no, no, 
My mm-hmm. prerequisite for the job, and it's just solidified more and more over the last seven weeks or whatever, is can you just hire – can you please just hire a coach who's who's done this at a Power 5 level? Um, I – I'm sorry, Jeff Monk, and I'm sure is a great guy. Like, <laughs> but can we can we see somebody who's done it in a major conference as a head coach uh, and who's proven? I mean, <coughs> I realize you can, I realize I realize you get the worst Power Five school in America. I realize you can throw Mike Riley back in my face and say, you know, Mike Riley, Mike, did, throw Mike, Lance Mike, Mike Riley he's been there did for it. two years, and he's a Kansas. I know, I know that. Like that's not. Army would beat Kansas the last. But 10 at years. least they're freaking playing Oklahoma and Texas, I, I and you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, they're I'm playing, playing big boy football, Devil's right? Advocate. Like, yep, I get it. Don't make this. Don't don't hire somebody who's who needs three years to to figure it out and right. like make the right. mistakes. And I agree. <clears throat> I mean, Scott Frost was was very well prepared in some ways. And he was very he was poorly prepared in other ways, and I just think Nebraska, with as many resources as they have, go find somebody who's done it. How much Absolutely. does that cost? You don't think they have it? I'm not saying it. I don't. I'm just saying how much does it cost? How much would you pay for that? They dump seven million bucks to save three weeks of public, <laughs> you know, publicity. Like I think they can. Yeah. I think they can afford the seven or eight million dollars that it takes a year to. To hire that coach, did they did they dump the seven million bucks because they wanted to give Mickey a chance to be the head coach? Is that why they did that? In hindsight, being twenty twenty, like is that what is that what was going on there? Because if they wait two or three more weeks, then it's like the season shot. He doesn't have a chance to retool in the bye week. Like the whole thing of like, okay, so they fire Scott, they play Oklahoma, they fire the defensive coordinator. Now, granted, I think Bill Bush has done a nice job. I think it was a reflection, and maybe I'm, maybe it's too obvious. I think it was, <laughs> I think it was an illustration of how poorly Scott was doing the job. Um, right. That either a Trev Alberts and Ted Carter and the people in charge couldn't stomach it anymore, uh, or b they were afraid that there was going to be <coughs> a real embarrassment at some point. Uh, and they they cut it off before that happened. That's it's it's so interesting to me, Dirk, because I feel like the, when Scott was let go, they were basically saying we would have we would have done this last year if the money people had been okay with it. So now we're just going to do it now, and the money people have to be okay with it. Like <laughs> like it it was almost as if it was like what would have happened if they had done this last year and done well, some other job. And there's another factor here, and we've learned this lesson over and over in the last ten years of college football. As an administrator, when you get the result that you want, you pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. So Nebraska loses to Georgia Southern, pull the trigger, right? Right. If he gives him if he doesn't want him to be the head coach and he gives him three more weeks and Scott goes out and beats Oklahoma. Or not even Oklahoma, you know, the mm-hmm. the one or two after that, then then you <coughs> you know, you might be stuck in a situation where he gets right. to six and six and then you gotta keep him again. Like he saw the result that he wanted to get the outcome that he wanted, right? And he pulled the trigger. I still think they did the right thing last year. I really do. Like too. that thing, the 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 public, the fan base was way too torn. They had to let it collapse, mm-hmm. you know, before they yep. before they got rid of it. Absolutely. If they'd done it last year, it would have been a mess. It would have been two thousand three on steroids. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I, I agree with you. I, yeah, I truly agree. believe that. I mean, yeah. they, they, there's no doubt they sacrificed this season. Like, it was a disaster. Uh, people will look back on this and say, what a mess. I can't believe they played nine games with an interim coach. But they did the right thing mm-hmm. because it would have been a longer-term PR mess had they gotten rid of Scott a year ago. Uh, but it was pretty clear to me that they, in September, that they, they could not – they knew he wasn't the guy, and they didn't want to give him a chance to to prove otherwise. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Dirk. So they go into they go into Saturday's game, and we don't need to linger here a long time. But I do want to talk briefly about uh, Jim Harbaugh was hired in 2015. Uh, Mike Riley was hired in 2015. Um, Jim Harbaugh took over a shitty situation <laughs> at Michigan. Wait a second, I didn't know we could swear on well, this. I just, we, I get, yeah. 
That ch- that's a game changer. We can use that. I mean, I don't know if everybody remembers what happened there, but it was bad. Like, Brady Hoke flamed out, but they had an AD that was, you know, giving away tickets on the backs of Coke bottles, and, um, you know, they played a player clearly concussed in a game. I don't know if you remember that. Shane Morris is out there wobbling around, and Ed Cunningham's like, what are they doing? You know, I remember that. And so the program had completely fallen apart when he gets there. Like, I mean, it had fallen apart. Um, He's still there, and he is he is on, I am not crapping you, he is on his third staff. Like, this is his third group of coordinators and everything. And they're good. How did he do that? And is it just a force of personality? Is it that they got lucky with recruits? How did he do that? And why? And what, what lesson is, is, there, is there, if any, to learn? Well, <clears throat> I think it starts with the fact that he he wasn't learning how to be a head coach. He'd been you know, he 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 done it for a long time. Starting I think at uh, San Diego, <clears throat> and then, and then uh, Stanford. He went to the Orange Bowl. He had a- a- Andrew Luck, of course. He, that's what it takes. But uh, and then he was he was in the NFL. I mean, he, he, and when he got there they they won they couldn't beat ohio state but that, they were, they were going to good bowl games they were good early and then they dipped yeah <clears throat> and then they and then he was basically out but he was on the hot seat because he couldn't beat ohio state but they weren't he wasn't out because they were 2 and 4 the one year he wasn't out because they sucked he was out because people were tired of his personality and he right. couldn't beat ohio state but he went to like the final weeks of his contract like it was, it was a bizarre situation where he didn't get a contract extension anywhere. Like early on, how did he do this? Like the last two teams, and I've watched a lot of them, are teams that I like. I genuinely respect. Yeah, they got their butt kicked against Georgia, fair. But this is this is the kind of football Nebraska would aspire to play. This is the kind of football Nebraska played in like '93. This is '93 Nebraska, '92 Nebraska. This is acceptable. How did he do it, Sam? I don't know. I'm not close enough. <clears throat> you, your ability to follow 74 different programs at the same time is is beyond my I follow comprehension. The Big Ten. <laughs> so answer your so answer your own question. Well, I, I'm curious what your own insights are from afar. But what I would say is that um, he he is one of those rare coaches that has been able to hire young assistants willingly. And 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 deal with the kinds of people they are. Like I think he's he's done sort of the opposite of what some people would do, which is like surround yourself with old guys or a young coach would surround himself with experience. He's a I would say Harbaugh's an experienced coach who has a you know his coordinators are in their thirties. They're young, they're aggressive. I think he's gotten guys on their way up, but I mean it's it's been just kind of a mess. I think some of it is that. I will say this. Michigan, the way they want to play football, has actually become closer to the new money ball than the spread. That's what I'd say. Isn't what... What they're doing is different enough from most teams in the Big Ten that it's actually more effective than it should be. Because most teams don't do what they do. Uh, So I think one one of Nick Saban's strengths, and there are many, is that He's secure enough to bring in coaches who sometimes they, they won't outshine him, but but they've got you know they either won't be there for long or they right. have they got baggage or they got agendas or whatever. And he does it because in Nick Saban's world, it's a meritocracy, and if you can help, we're going to bring you in. Right? Uh, isn't that similar to what Harbaugh's doing with with assistant coaches, where you know his his personal. Uh, Ego, he's able to set that aside and and go find hot young coaches. Um, and maybe there's a contrast there with what Scott wasn't willing to do at Nebraska, which is, you know, <clears throat> bring in guys that that who were better than the guys that he brought from Central Florida. Mm-hmm. I think he has a considerable ego, and for whatever reason, he is he he expresses. Trust that me, ego. I know I know right. Jim Harbaugh has an has an ego, but it's not. He expresses it in this way, like this is an expression of his ego, is to use. 
is to use his his considerable wallet, you know, the money that they have, to spread this sort of giant tree of coaches. Like I think that's part of it's an extension. Of his. Yeah, he does. I don't think he does well with guys that are like his age <coughs> in his in his operation. I don't. Know. I, I I'm just impressed by how someone who is clearly dysfunctional. Like I mean, the guy almost left for the Vikings. Um, Regard. I mean, he's he has Looking been politically mind. incorrect in like five different ways. He picks fights openly with other Big Ten coaches, and yet they're good. Think about what he did when he first got there. He did all the, all, the, all these uh, satellite camps in the SEC. Oh, yeah. He was he was trying to troll them, and um, he showed up at the the Big Ten media days with his hat and oh, yeah. uh, uh, I mean a uh, coaching outfit on instead of the suit, and he stood out like. Like some oddball, and he 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 was a different guy, and you, and then all of a sudden you, you you don't hear about any of that stuff anymore. He just coaches. He's different. Well, he's he. Yep, that's interesting. But you guys, the ability. I mean, I hate to dumb it down too much because it, it's a reflection of how little I understand it. But the ability to recruit and develop offensive and defensive linemen is just. It, <laughs> It puts you in such a position of well, strength absolutely. that you never – your margin for error is so much bigger when you have Michigan's lines. Uh, and Nebraska is is at the other end of the spectrum and has been for a very long time That's, now. Um, and, and until Nebraska can, can get within at least viewing distance of, of what Michigan has up front – you know they're they're never gonna they're never gonna touch them, and you're gonna see it Saturday at the Big House. Let's move on to basketball. Nebraska's gonna lose, right, on Saturday in the Big House. I thought you meant against UNO tonight. It might. I don't think they will. Um, but okay, let's move on to Nebraska basketball. We can talk about UNO too or Creighton. I don't really care. I mean, um, let's talk about that. Uh, I thought Nebraska. I thought Nebraska basketball played about its best opener in a long time. They, they didn't play a very good team, but they responded when necessary, and they won. Are you going to crap on it then? They won. <laughs> that's the standard right now. They That's the bar. Yeah. You that's looked the, at me with one. You're going to get all worked up over a W? No, I didn't say anything. Don't look at me like that. If I'm they just, lose to UNO tonight, that's a problem. I'm, ske- <laughs> I'm skeptical. Uh, I didn't think what they showed um, – you know, demonstrated a lot of dominance. I think they, they just, they're not very athletic. Um, they're just going to struggle to score like crazy. I mean, it's just going to be, if, if, if the best option to score is, you know, clear out for <coughs> Sam Greasel, it's going to be a tough year. Jawan Gary put back. Uh, their, that's their score. Yeah. yeah. And they just, you know, and, and, Tominaga is going to have to hit six threes and somehow going to have to defend on the other end. And it's just, it's, it's going to be hard. I think, um, Gary is, is exciting. I mean, he gives them some energy and they're, uh, they're going to have to just be scrappy as hell, Sam. I mean, they just are. I did that. It's okay. And I, I don't know if they, if they can adopt that identity. Okay. We'll see. Uh, they're going to have to score at some point. Um, <laughs> but the uh, – which is – yeah, your Fred Hoiberg's team, they can't score. Hey, okay. they outscored Creighton. Um, seven more points at Creighton. Uh, well, that, that. Yeah, well. Hmm? Great. I, we we talk about them too if you Tweaking want. Tweaking the Nebraska fans who <clears throat> listen to this. Yeah, they, they love um, hearing the word Creighton. They just I love thought, that word. <laughs> I thought the Big Ten would – you know, part of Nebraska being able to do anything to save uh, the, the Hoiberg uh, era this year it would be the Big Ten would be down. And I, I, Iowa kind of came out of the gate and scored like 100 points or something. I mean, that well, I, Iowa's going to be good. I was not expecting that. Um, okay. I mean, they're, they're always good, but to come right out of the gate like that yeah. um, after what they lost, I, I you know what I mean? So yeah, I know um, what you mean. He's going to, you know, it's not going to be like. But I still think this is his fourth year, and it sounds crazy to say that, you know, I, I think I, for a job like Nebraska, I, I think it, it, it takes longer than four years, but you've got to be able to – you've got to show something. And he's started the 
off on the wrong foot. He had the wrong approach. You know, I didn't play. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the way you got to play in the Big Ten. I just, I didn't show an, any understanding of that. I mean, it's 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 just it's for, for a guy who I think is very smart. He did not play it. Uh, it, it was it was like he was just oblivious to the, to, to, to the job at hand, and um, almost like Frost, just oh, I'm going to do it my way, and, it, and it's going to work. Well, no. Um, so now here he is in year four, and he's trying to, he's trying to do it the other way. So um, <clears throat> I don't think Trev is uh, is in a hurry to change coaches, but I, I, as we've seen, I, he will, and I don't think it'll be. I don't think it. I, 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 I don't think it'll be during the season. I think it'll be, it'll be after. But um, what, what's the bar going to be? How many does he have to win? You know, what does it have to look like? So it's, 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 it, it, it'll never be. It, this team will, will never be pretty. It, it's going to be ugly. So. We're going to know by Christmas. <clears throat> you know, because <clears throat> what what these guys have to go through. Uh, and I'm not seeing any of these programs or powerhouses, but Nebraska basketball will go Arkansas Pine Bluff, who which lo- almost beat somebody, TCU, yeah. Oklahoma, which lost or uh, Radford or whatever. Yeah, but it's still a power conference team. Yeah. They'll play two more in Orlando. Then they play Boston College, who again power conference team, not very exciting. Uh, Creighton at Creighton at Indiana, Purdue, Kansas State. <laughs> it's not, it's that's hard. all in a row. Yeah, it's hard. like that's. <laughs> In a span of four weeks, they yeah. play essentially eight real basketball games. Yeah, uh, we're gonna not Doc Sadler. We're, we're gonna know by Christmas. Not the Doc Sadler special. Yeah, we will. We'll know more. You know what, Sam? Mm-hmm. I think on almost both sides, Creighton and Nebraska, I think the women are gonna be this. This might be the best year of women's basketball. It could be to watch I agree. in the state. In yeah. geez, a long time. I look forward to it. I, I sure hope. So they play next Tuesday. So we're recording before um, we're recording before that game. We, we will not record again until that game is over. Uh, the women's basketball in the state uh, certainly isn't what the volleyball programs are, but it's getting there. And um, you know, it, it, the, the the caliber of the two teams right now um, is as high as it's been consecutively for a long time and stylistically I, fun to watch they are fun to watch uh, Cray- Creighton is uh, Creighton is uh, interesting in the sense that they are um, built to to do the three-point stuff but they're actually way grittier than people think and Creighton actually excels at playing kind of a gritty style yeah. of basketball Nebraska I think bills itself as gritty but they actually play a kind of a pretty style when they're on when they're hitting all cylinders the women I mean um, they're actually a lot of fun. And unfortunately, they burned one of their five great games offensively on UNO, which is unfortunate. They need to be able to do that against other good teams. But it's a complete team. And I understand that people focus on missing Sam Hybe. She's injured right now. Uh, the team would be better with Sam, but, but they're going to be quite good without her. They're, it's going to be it's going to be okay. The caliber of the game piece tonight is is what we have not had with the men. It's it's always been Never. sort of, it's just been sort of like the lopsided deal, and it hasn't been lopsided for Nebraska in a long time. But um, you know, the twenty six win Nebraska team in ninety ninety one played the Creighton team that went to the second round and beat New Mexico State, and Nebraska won that game by like thirty. Yep. It's, it's so it wasn't competitive. Argu- That's like arguably the, the best game. It's arguably the best game Nebraska played that year um, against Creighton. Yeah, and Creighton was great. But those that's probably the last time that the two teams were equally as good at the exact same time. Am I wrong about that? What, what year was he in? What, what, what? 90-91. Yeah, because in night in two thousand fifteen, fourteen fifteen when. Nebraska was supposed to be really good. Creighton was rebuilding. That they just lost Doug. There was Cray- down Creighton down. upset him. I did. There uh, was a, a, a around ninety nine. Uh, it was it was starting to turn. Uh, that, uh, that 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 was Dana's first NCAA team. Yep. And that that was a, that was a very good Nebraska team. And I remember one year, uh, the, the game was in Lincoln and. Um, Larry Florence uh, shut down Rodney Buford, 
and that was about a, as, as equal as it's been. The turning um, point was was ninety nine, I think. Creighton, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Creighton beat them, I think, up here. Yeah. Um, and that was a that was a big moment for for Dana. Um, but yeah, I mean, Nebraska, Nebraska's just always had a hard time with them. Like even when Nebraska has been equally talented, they've they they frequently play one of their worst games of the year against Creighton. Well, it's kind of like Iowa football. Nebraska did not take Creighton seriously enough. Um, and so that game was always a game that meant more to Creighton after a certain point. And it, I'll be very honest with you, I think it still does. And that's that's part of the issue. And with, with Iowa football, it's the same thing. Like that game here in a couple of weeks is going to mean, I'm serious, it's going to mean more to Iowa. It just is. Like Nebraska's got to find a way to shed this we're Nebraska and we can't have rivals identity um, with, with Creighton in basketball. And with <coughs> Iowa and football, it's and the they, too, it's the too cool for school thing. That's like, right. They have to. I don't to study. It. Yeah, I got a I got a C on the test, but it's only because I didn't study. Right. It's like, come on. That's that's a challenge that they've got. I mean, and it's hard. I think it's hard for Fred. Like it, it's gonna. It was obviously Tim Miles. I think put a lot into that Creighton game. He did. That mattered a lot to him. It psyched him, but he he, but he the got team all did not. Yeah. The team did not feel that. No. Like you've got to find a way to make those players, and then the fan base has to accept. That the Creighton game is really important and it's it's worth winning, not just because you can like you know make make the the the, the blue team feel bad, but because it, it should matter intrinsically. Iowa football is the same way, and I think Nebraska is getting closer, but they have to have a coach. I'm I'm serious. The the next coach that comes in has to be like this is a big game and we're going to circle it. And it's going to matter and we're going to try to win it, and we're going to be on national TV and all oh, we're excited and it's Iowa and we don't like them. They've got to find a way to generate that. Because, uh, unfortunately, I think Nebraska does. They do this too cool for school. Back to the women for a second. Uh, the Nebraska women, I think, again, uh, they're, they're missing Sam. But the way that they're able to account for her absence, I think they'll be fine. Uh, they're going to play Creighton on Tuesday. It's a big game. I, I Honestly, I think Nebraska's probably got a, a little bit more talent. But I think Creighton's got a lot of toughness. Uh, that team they're so well coached they're co- they're coached well and they're really tough yeah. uh, he's got a lot of uh he's got a lot of women on that team who for whatever reason he probably recruits it they're not real tall but they're just tough and well, they I, they take a lot I, of shots to the face and like they're just tough i, I you know I, <clears throat> the the crowds go up and down for these things uh but boy the uh, when the uh, 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 the people see a winner they get it a little excited, especially in Lincoln right now. I would love to see the, um, the what this game might draw if, if it was in the the big place. Um, well, then Creighton would lose its advantage. We said, I, that's, yeah, absolutely. Like, but they wouldn't have a home court. Uh, it would be a half. It'd be a half and half. That's what Coach Booth does in volleyball, though. It's it, it's Cause better for the player otherwise. Well, but. <laughs> It is better for the sport if they do that. I agree with you. Like and, I, and, 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 I, I, I totally almost won it this year. Oh, yeah. From my perspective, yeah. if I'm if I'm Booth at this point, I'm like, you know what? We're a top fifteen team. If you don't really want to play us at Sokol, then just don't play us. Yeah. We'll come and play you, but yeah. we're not gonna. You know, like we're not gonna give away half of our crowd. Yeah. I get it. You're trying to set an attendance record. Yay! All that, but. Like, at some point, you should just go ahead and make, uh, you just play us on our own floor. And if that floor is not good enough for you, then, then we'll, go, go, we'll, go, we'll go play Minnesota or Wisconsin. They'll yeah. come play us. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about it as much. I think in basketball, mm-hmm. this, the tradition is set. And, like, if either one of those teams tried to be funny with it and tried to pull out in some way, it would, it would create a lot of bad feelings. And, you know, you, you tip your cap to Amy and to Connie. So Connie's part of the rivalry still. She's now on the Creighton side again. She kind of functions as an advisor, all that. But she's, I mean, I think she's handled it really well. Amy's handled it really well. And Sam, isn't it? And you've documented this really well, especially last spring. But, like, for Nebraska with Amy Williams to basically go five years of being a mediocre program. Mm-hmm. And suddenly find its stride in year six and year seven. Yep, pretty unusual. It is unusual. It is. They, yes, it's it's unusual. You always think about 
you know, Moneyball is, is just a catch-all term for how do you get good without having, and by A, getting lucky, or B, finding an untapped resource. So the way they were able to do that is A, they got lucky in the sense that Alexis Markowski was willing to reopen her recruiting, and she got a lot better, um, and she, so you, they got her. B, they got lucky that Allison Widener is who she is and wa- obviously wanted to play for Nebraska and small-town kid who was helped, I think, along the way. She was under the radar, and then she got part some good teams. And then B, an untapped resource. So the linchpin of their recruiting in Australia is a relationship they built with another player that I don't think came to Nebraska who ended up at, at Idaho State or it wasn't quite good enough for Nebraska – but it's the sister of Isabel Bourne. And Izzy is the linchpin. So Izzy comes here, she's here, and she's like very, very close friends with Jazz Shelley, who's probably one of the 12 best players in school history. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. She's really good. Um, and when Jazz decides she wants to leave Oregon because, uh, what was her name? Ionescu leaves there and graduates, and Jazz didn't want to be there anymore. Recruiting Isabel Bourne is what got you. And they have a relationship with Australia that Amy had cultivated when she was at South Dakota. It's that pipeline. So it's the recruiting pipe. It's the relationships they built with Australian, with the AIS, the Australian Institute of Sport. And that's what's, that's the reason. So like you find ways to try to find a way to set up a team and build it. Native, um, native, uh, native daughters and, uh, and Aussies. That's an, uh, that's an interesting... Uh, and the first one's lucky. You can't control where people grow up. The second one is, the second one is how, do we, how do we recruit elite players that are not... We're not going to get a top 30 player from the East Coast, and they don't. They've stopped recruiting, basically, out there. Because you, don't, you can't get them away from Maryland or uh, you know, Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, Duke, Connecticut. You can't get them. Um, and then the other big, the other big wellspring of talent in in the Midwest, and this is sort of under the radar, but it's true now, is Minneapolis. So Minneapolis is a is 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 one of the hotbeds of of prep basketball. Chet Holmgren came from there, but so did Paige Beckers. It has become this sort of hotbed for for basketball, not football. Oddly enough, not football, but basketball. And any team that re- that's in the Midwest has to recruit Minneapolis in basketball. That includes Fred. Fred's going to have to get better at recruiting that area. Now, you, we can see where Fred likes to recruit. He likes to go, well, where Matt Abdelmassi liked to recruit was California. Eli Rice is in Nashville, <clears throat> Tennessee, and they recruit nationally. He's got to get better at recruiting Minneapolis because a lot of great players well, come Well, that should there. be easy for him. It should be, but they haven't done a very good job. No. Minnesota's probably going to be a pretty good basketball team because they're going to get some kids from right around their area. And Nebraska women's basketball has recruited a bunch of kids from the Minneapolis area, and that helps them. Um, so, like, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, that, that Minneapolis is one of those places, but it really, really is. Two years in a row, the number one boys basketball recruit in the country came from Minneapolis, Jalen Suggs and Chet Holmgren. And then two years in a row, two out of three years, the number one women, girls basketball recruit came from Minnesota. Paige, and then some other player whose name I don't know uh, was this most recent year. So, that's where you go. So, do we think next Thursday when we do this that that there will be a not a coach name, but at least a strong rumor for football? Yeah, I don't. Nope. I think it'll be another week after that. It's gonna go all the way down to the wire. I do. I think if <clears throat> I think if it's Lance Leipold, like Dirk thinks, or his potential, or if it's anybody who's coaching, that Trev's gonna find a way to not. Let that bleed into what they're doing, and wh- who's Kansas's last game? It's a weird last game. It's not. It's at K State. It's at K State, so it is K State because yeah. sometimes it's been Texas in the past. So no, it's it's at that's that's that's, that's big uh, for him. And um, was that on Saturday? Mm-hmm. So yeah, they, they, if, if it's him, they've, they've got to keep it quiet at least until then. I mean, you, you can't have he he would not want it to come out that week. And by the way, Kansas might lose their last three games. It, yes, they might. <laughs> at Texas Tech, Texas at home, mm-hmm. at K-State. If you could choose between Kleiman and Leipold, who would you pick? Whew. I know which one I'd pick. 
if you'd they both come. You'd pick Kleiman, obviously. I would. Between the two, if they both come, I would pick Kleiman. Yes. Why? Would. Because the way they play the game is the way that I would like to see Nebraska play the game. The way Kansas State plays, the way North Dakota State played, that's my way of playing. If I had to pick. So Kleiman, so Kleiman comes and brings Adrian Martinez as his quarterback's coach. How about yeah, that? Quarterback's that coach. Yeah. Down. Yeah, so I'm back as a quarterback coach. <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah. And Colin Klein would take over at K-State. I don't think there'd be a single hesitation of that. Right. He'd be the youngest head coach in college football, but Colin Klein would take the job. Yep. I don't think K-State would bat an eye. They'd be like, Colin's he, ready. He's 30, what, two? He'd probably be very good, too. Yeah. It, may, it, it might take a few years, but yeah. So I don't think they would bat an eye. I think Kansas State would have a succession plan. Um. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to knock Leipold. I think he would be a, a really interesting coach. I just think that Kleiman's strategy would be we're going to do what we do at Kansas State, we're going to do it in the Big Ten, and we're going to recruit the Midwest, and I know just where to go. And he would – he would. I think he would – but I don't think he's going to come because I think he's got a perfect situation where he's at. And I'm, Nebraska's a big bubble. And I'm not just, everybody wants to be in that. I'm just curious to see how um, how long the, the, the Trev Alberts uh, – uh, the force field is going to last because um, it's 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 but unbelievable that it's been so quiet and Maybe nobody told no nobody that, done that it. happens when you uh, have your guy yeah, yeah. so or when that, you've been told no that doesn't happen when you when you're making six calls yeah, a day yeah I know I just but why hasn't that guy why hasn't anything come out on that guy right well maybe it is Munkin I don't know and hey you know what if that's the way they want to go it. I'm I'm intrigued to see it. I think Munkin has has done everything he can do with the service academy that he's at, the U.S. Military Academy. Um, I think he's done everything he can do there. So let's see if that if that formula works at a Power Five school. They probably wouldn't run the wing bone. They'd probably run some version of Power Eye with some option, throwing the football when you have to. And you know what I'm saying? Like those, like if you. 19, so when Paul Johnson went from Navy to Georgia Tech, 90 all over again. Right, well, when Paul Johnson went from Navy to Georgia Tech, he literally ran the same offense. And by the way, they won an ACC title doing that. But they 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 ran the same damn thing. I don't think any service academy coach would now do that. They would come and they'd be like, ah, you know what? They'd probably look at like what Frank Solich did at Ohio or you know, they they would it'd be a blend. It'd be a little bit of power football or what Coastal Carolina does. They would do that. It wouldn't be, we're, we're literally going to have a T out here and, you know, like, you know, a power I. <clears throat> I'd be intrigued to see what Munkin could do. Um, I think he's got a real active agent, and I think Munkin likes a little bit of Munkin. But that's okay. Lots of coaches have big egos. so They all have egos. Um, they do. Mike didn't. I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think Kleinman is going to come, by, but I, I think White Pole is a possibility. We'll see. Oh, but, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm for the coach that'll actually, you know, show up. What about Gary? So it was Gary Patterson or Lance Leipold? Which would you pick? Uh, Lance. Okay. Yeah. I just Patterson uh, would be fascinating. It would. I mean, that would, would be, be yeah. an amazing experiment, right? But he'd have to have some people around. I mean, he's, he, he, I mean, he's a very energetic guy. He likes to get after his players too. Mm-hmm. Um, but he'd have to. I'd, I'd just be worried about like, okay. The the gas the gas gauge is on low, yeah. and uh, I don't care if you went to Texas; uh, it's still going to be on low. Um, That's fair. Of Tracy the, Clays is his defensive coordinator. Of the ten most successful college football coaches of this century, Gary Patterson's on the list. He is, yeah. And he's only sixty three years old, sixty two right. years old. Well, it's intriguing. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a CEO guy who can come in. And, and 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 really uh, shaped the Nebraska football program for this uh, this era uh, with the NIL and everything and you know uh, recruiting office and and set up the whole model. Um, I, I'm probably a little bit stating the obvious here, but Trev Alberts has a high regard for professionalism and polish, and I think you saw that in his disappointment in Scott Frost. Um, yes. I think you see it in the way that Trev carries himself and communicates. 
The next coach yeah, is sued on the fourth of July. That's true. The next coach is going to he's going to be the picture of professionalism and polish. Um or at least be able to pass, you know, pass that test. Uh I don't think you're gonna see a somebody that they have to worry about from a PR standpoint or someone who has a hard <coughs> has a hard time you know, shaking hands with boosters. I just okay. don't think that's what Travis is going to want. I agree. If he can get him, if he can get that guy. All right. So, okay, so let's do an over-under really quickly. <laughs> over-under on Thanksgiving Day. Under means that they, we know who the coach is before, over is after. I think before. Okay. You? Over. What does over mean? Two days, three days after Thanksgiving. After. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go after. Yeah, uh, we'll see. I think it gets out before. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind it. I'd love to be able to plan my weekend that weekend. <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't want to be driving away from Black Friday in Iowa Beach, Nebraska, eleven to nine, and we have no idea what the weekend holds. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about this last week, but Nebraska football in the tumult around Nebraska football has ruined so many Thanksgiving weekends over the last 20 years. It's not even funny. Remember 2014, we were all in that van yeah. driving back after the Iowa game, and they come back and beat Iowa in overtime. The, Barney Cott. The, nine wins. Nine wins, baby. And uh, <laughs> this, this, this stupid Ferentz move, he – he, he not only punted once to right. uh, person out yeah. twice. Yeah. Um, and when we're going, okay, if, if, if they fire Polini, it'll be tomorrow, right? right. And, and we thought he was done right. after they won, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he was, but not till Sunday. So I, I, after Saturday, I'm thinking, it's not going to happen. And then Sunday morning, here's our email, 10 a.m. Yep. Yep. So and Mike Riley was on the Saturday after. And... and and the guy showed up to talk. There wasn't much suspense in that one. No. Bill Callahan was two days I after. especially love yeah. – no, Bill's was the next day. Next day, that's right. I especially love how Nebraska has created this tradition now where fired head coaches come to the press conferences. Uh, Doc did it. Tim did it. Uh, did he? He kind of – he had a little mini presser. Well, right he was there. Yeah. That stadium. Uh, and he finished it with, I'm going to go have a Coors Light now. He's still having pressers, I guess. Uh, I think San Jose it, State, uh, or no, at uh, five, 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 the, the fire throne in the uh, the locker room. Um, he still hangs out, but uh, occasionally. Oh, he's, he's probably going to live in a well, after he's done <clears throat> at yeah. San Jose State. He can run for governor. Yeah, I'll tell you what, he just might. All right, I think that's a, that's it for this week. <laughs> We're going to go up to Michigan. We're going to eat some good food. We're going to hang out in the big house. We're going to have lots of coverage from up there. I'm going to um, go. Are the Lions home on Sunday? <laughs> um, Actually, I think I think they uh, they are not. I think they're going to the Bears. They're playing the Bears. Well, well you would know if anybody would know that. Well, so I don't tw- know where the game's at, but they're playing the Bears. In 2011, <laughs> when we went up there and Levante David played the best game I've ever seen a middle linebacker play. Yep, it was pretty uh, special. The next day, Sue was playing – uh, he was playing against Cam Newton, and I went to the to the Panthers Lions game the next day and and talked to Sue. So. What was the first Michigan game? 2011. Uh, 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 Denard Robinson. Yep, Denard um, went nuts. Forty five seventeen. So when did they when did they win up there? Twenty thirteen. Sam and I still argue about that. That was a great that was a great <clears throat> win. That was a lot. Of that fun. was not a great win. That was a great win. <laughs> Michigan good? sucked. Nebraska got lucky, as they very often did in the fall the, of 2013. The Detroit Airport Marriott. That's all I can think about. Is, <laughs> is that where uh, you're staying again? Yes. I and so. uh, I think I think it's been refurbished. They, they might actually serve food now. Um, but the um, We watched the 2011 Iowa State-Oklahoma State game there. The one yes, game that Oklahoma and we State did. Right. I remember that. After I'd taken a flight from, like, Benton Harbor, Michigan, and Iron Mountain, Michigan. Yes, you did. What were you thinking? I told him. I I told him. Don't ever do that again. He looked at me. He's like, don't ever do that again. Okay. You were like. I was in in a plane in the dark. We just we were waiting for a part. We're surrounded (laughs) by (laughs) Michigan forest, deciduous forest, or whatever they call the forest up there. There are college hockey writers who didn't go where you were. No, I know. And um, we're just waiting. We see these two two lights in the dark, these two headlights. And it's like a single car ribboning through the darkness, you know. Uh, <laughs> that was the part. 
This, the plane was silent. There was about seven people the, on the plane uh, eating Delta co- little Delta biscotti cookies. Yeah, I don't remember the, the Michigan game. That's that my year, bad attempt at Jimmy Watkins story. But I remember the uh, two weeks later they played at Penn State, and that was the snowstorm. The very next week, I think, Tom. Yeah, I'll never forget yeah. that one. If they won at Michigan and Penn State, and they came home and lost to somebody they shouldn't have I, lost to. So eleven. So eleven was the year that. That was when the paternal thing blew up, oh my and we God. were out there. It was right after the Michigan game. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Remember big that? win for Nebraska. I mean, and Le- Levante, speaking of Levante, is probably his best play of his <clears> career, <throat> yeah. one of them. Uh, and then the one with the, the, the field goal <laughs> was was two years later. That was the um, snowstorm. You know, we'll talk Never about, forget those games. We, we, we can talk about this next week or in two weeks, but the, 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 the big story the last week will be where, where does Mickey go? And is, is he staying or going? And uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. next week could be his his, his last appearance uh, at home. So um, that could be a column. Well, I don't know. We'll see. People really like the guy. Uh, I think they'd like him even more if he would grab the play sheet from his offensive coordinator. He would. He's funny. One of the, one of his biggest advantages, Mickey's, is that he's genuinely funny. Not just trying to be funny. He's not just trying. He's funny. All right. That's our that's our podcast for this week. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week.